the next uh, demonstrative. And um, Professor, what level of support have religious, progressive religions provided to the political goals of gays and lesbians? If, if we look at uh, progressive religious uh, communities, uh, they've been increasingly supportive of LGBT rights and uh, the rights of uh, same-sex marriage. If, um, so evidence of this would be um, the California Council of Churches, which is an umbrella organization that includes uh, many um, faith-based organizations, churches um, uh, throughout the state. And many of those denominations uh, supported um, uh, are, that, that uh, organization in which these denominations are part supported um, prop, or, uh, same sex marriage and opposed Proposition 8. Some examples of member organizations include uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the Christian Church, uh, Church of the Brethren, um, the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Church of Christ, and the United Methodist Church. That's not an exhaustive list as a, some of the members of that organization. What role, if any, did these organizations play in the Prop 8 campaign? Well, uh, the member organizations, as well as the umbrella organization, many of them um, were active in the attempt to uh, defeat Proposition 8. And that was evidenced by um, phone banking and s sending out um, direct mail and, and other activities as well as um, uh, various contributions that they made to the campaign. So I would say the progressive uh, religious organizations were actively involved in the opposition to Proposition 8. Uh, uh, in addition to Proposition 8, what, if anything, have these progressive religions done to support the political goals of gays and lesbians? Well, um, California Council of Churches has a lobbying arm, and they've worked within the, the California um, legislature to promote legislation in favor of LGBT rights, um, and including uh, Senator Leno's bill, AB 43, to um, uh, seek to end the ban on same-sex marriage in California. They also, the organization also filed an amicus brief in the, the case in the California Supreme Court challenging Proposition 8 after the election. All right, what is your understanding of the intensity of support for same-sex marriage among pr progressive religious groups? Uh, there might be a range, but I think increasingly um, among many progressive religious organizations, there's a, there's a, they've come to the conclusion that this is a social justice issue, a civil rights issue, and it's consistent with their view of the religious faith that it's important to advocate on behalf of LGBT rights and the rights of same-sex marriage. Uh, some of the denominations that I listed there are somewhat internally divided on this question, and there's debates internally within um, these uh, churches. But I think increasingly you're seeing among progressive uh, religious organizations increasing support for um, LGBT rights. And so there's a high level of intensity um, in many of these organizations. In, um, they see this as, some of, their, some of them see this as their primary work, that this is a major issue of the day, and uh, they want to advocate on behalf of gays and lesbians. Excuse me, Mr. Thompson. Let me ask, of those uh, denominations that are described in the demonstrative, I believe it was. Oh, yeah, let's one. go back to 22, please. All of those uh, religious denominations perform same-sex marriages? Uh, looking through the list, no, not all of them do. Some of them, this, this, so the California Council of Churches is an umbrella organization. <coughs> which, <coughs> which ones do and which ones do not? Uh, I would have to take a closer look at that. I, I, know, I believe that the United Church of Christ does. Um, the United Methodist Church is internally divided on this question, and I think they've had retired uh, United Methodist pastors who've performed that um, uh, same-sex marriages. Um, I don't know exactly the status with the Episcopal Church at this point. This, there's been some recent developments um, in the Episcopal Church, so I would have to take a, I don't know, a closer look at that. But uh, you have a situation where oftentimes in California, the local denominations and um, structures of these organizations may have um, a view on this, which is more progressive and liberal than the national or, or global 
communion, for, for example, with Anglicanism. So I would say within California, all these groups have joined the California Council of Churches. California Council of Churches has taken public positions on these issues in favor of LGBT rights and same-sex marriage. Okay. And uh, turning to demonstrative uh, 24, how does the level of religiosity in California compare to other states? Uh, so this is information from the, the Pew uh, Research Center. They've done surveys, um, a well-respected organization. And according to their research, uh, California is one of the 10 least religious states in the United States, um, with over 20 percent of the population um, in these surveys claiming to have no religious affiliation, and a third of Californians saying that they seldom or never attend religious services. So, like I think, I think, so I think it's fair to say that California is a more secular, less religious state than most of the United States. And um, turning your attention to professional associations, to what extent, if any, do gays and lesbians have political allies among prominent professional associations? Uh, I think it's, it's, again, fair to say that most of the major um, professional associations have increasingly um, allied with the LGBT rights movement. and with gays and lesbians. Um, some examples would be uh, associations of psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, university professors, um, and uh, bar associations, both national and, and local bar associations. Now, with respect to university professors, how, if at all, can university professors have an impact as political allies? Uh, well, in my experience, professors function in a number of different arenas. One is their teaching function, so they're obviously communicating uh, a perspective on these matters to their students. Um, and that's, that's a major, um, I think, role in which persuasan can have a, a fact in, uh, an effect in making social change. Professors also are often public intellectuals, where they will uh, write opinion pieces or uh, testify before um, legislative bodies or so forth. And many uh, professors, both at the state and national level, move in and out of government service themselves. So many go on to um, serve in, for example, the administration, and they'll come back to um, the academy after that. All right, very well. And legal organizations, how, if at all, can they be uh, political allies for a group? So uh, lawyers, in general, are um, very active in the political process. They um, oftentimes um, will run for office themselves, serve in office, be in appointed positions. They also serve as uh, a gatekeeping function for the, for the judiciary. All judges have been lawyers at one time, so that's um, uh, a gatekeeping function. They also, uh, through the American Bar Association, uh, give ratings for judicial appointments. And so these professional associations have an important function in sort of shaping uh, the, uh, the, the policy or public policy making arena as well. All right. Now, uh, we've talked about allies. I'd like to turn your attention to another uh, determinant of political power, which you identified, which is persuasion. How, if at all, does persuasion uh, play as a determinant of power? Okay, so persuasion, by which I would mean that the power of ideas, which is different than the, the, the power of contributing money or the power of coercion. The power is of, one idea, of one, one's ideas is, in my view, an important factor that can be brought to bear in um, gaining political power. Um, and so if you have an idea and you're able to persuade uh, a person in power that your idea is um, you know, it should be acted on. Your ability to persuade that, that um, lawmaker is, is critical. In the initiative process, that's basically what you've got, your ability to persuade voters of your position on an issue. And so um, in many different ways, persuasion, the power of one's ideas, is critical in the political process. Well, can you provide an example of when uh, the persuasive force of a group's ideas uh, led to a political outcome that was favorable to the group? Uh, I, I think one uh, classic example would be the um, civil rights movement for African Americans, where um, 
this was a group that was seen historically to have very little political power, which was, in my view, correct. And so there was a, a, a challenge for how that group could achieve power in the political uh, system. And one of the primary instruments that this movement used was the power of ideas, that being able to persuade the American people that the norm of equality, which um, Americans deeply hold um, uh, as, a, as an, a core value and the norm of fairness, was being violated in their case. And so they were able to make that case through persuasion of lawmakers and the general public of, of their case. And so I think the norm of equality is something that can be used in a persuasive way to convince lawmakers of, uh, of uh, the rightness of your claim. All right. Now, we, we've talked about determinants of power. I'd like to switch gears and ask you about the indicia of power. And uh, what success, if any, have gays and lesbians had in electing candidates of their choice? Okay, so I'm going to focus on California, and um, the, the evidence is that um, in this state there's been uh, increasing success um, of the LBGT movement in um, being able to endorse candidates uh, that win elections um, in California. Uh, some evidence of that would come from Equality California, which uh, regularly sort of assesses the level of progress they've had in um, basically electing uh, candidates of their choice. Uh, from the last statewide election uh, posted on the Equality California website, said, um, uh, noted that Californians, quote, voted into the legislature and top state offices 95 percent of the candidates endorsed by Equality California's Political Action Committee, um, EQCA PAC, the EQUA PAC. Uh, endorsed 62 candidates for the legislature and state offices. A total of 59 of those candidates prevailed in yesterday's election, including newly elected Lieutenant Governor John Garamendi, Secretary of State Deborah Bowen, Controller John Chong, Treasurer Bill Lockyer, and Attorney General Jerry Brown. How much of a price did uh, the uh, political figures who voted in favor of the same-sex marriage bill pay in the most recent election? Uh, again, according to uh, Equality California and other sources, um, all of the uh, 23 incumbents who um, ran for re-election in the legislature after uh, uh, th that vote on same-sex marriage won re-election. So to answer your question, there was no political price in terms of their re-election that they paid um, for that vote. All right. Now, t turning to... Uh California legislative victories. How successful, if at all, have gays and lesbians been in gaining political victories in the California legislature? Okay, I've reviewed um, uh, a range of legislation over, uh, over time to protect uh, the rights um, and interests of gays and lesbians. And over the course of um, the past decade and more, there have been laws enacted by the California legislature uh, prohibiting sexual orientation discrimination in a range of different areas. And so those include employment, housing, public education, in labor organizations, um, with respect to adoption and foster care, public contracting, um, insurance, state-funded <laughs> programs, and business services. And these are, these are just some of the highlights of many different um, legislative victories that have um, been achieved in the California legislature protecting the rights of uh, gays and lesbians. Some other examples would be a hate crimes law, punishment for hate crimes committed on account of sexual orientation, um, the recognition, as we've said, of domestic partnerships in California, in a series of different victories leading up to um, the, the broad domestic partner protections that we have in California today. And altogether, I've identified over 50 uh, legislative victories for the LGBT uh, community in the California State Legislature. Now, what is the history of legislation relating to the legal recognition of same-sex couples in California? Uh, so after the passage of Proposition 22 in 2000, which declared by statute um, in the Family Code that only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. 
Um, the California legislature, nevertheless, uh, in two separate bills, both authored by Mark Leno, um, adopted laws that would make uh, marriage gender neutral in California, basically uh, attempting to reverse the outcome of Proposition 22. In both instances, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger vetoed those bills. In his veto messages, he said, and I think it's been borne out by an opinion of the California Supreme Court that under the law, under the rules, the constitutional rules for the initiative process in California, the legislature cannot um, amend or repeal um, initiatives adopted by the voters. And so, um, nevertheless, there was a strong showing in the legislature for changing California's marriage laws uh, to make them gender neutral or to allow for same-sex marriage. When, were, uh, when was the uh, recognition of same-sex couples first achieved as a legal matter in California? Uh, the first domestic partnership law was in 1999, um, and it protect, protected and gave um, benefits for uh, domestic partners in California. That was the first of a series of domestic partnership bills that worked their way through the legislature. And when were the first local laws? Uh, at the local level, uh, the city of Berkeley in uh, 1984 passed um, this state's first um, uh, municipal domestic partnership uh, ordinance. Um, the next year, the city of West Hollywood followed with a comparable um, ordinance. And in the next uh, 15 years, 18 other municipalities, um, local governments, passed domestic partnership laws. And what did uh, AB 849 pertain to? Uh, 849, if I'm remembering the, uh, uh, the number correctly, I, I think that was the, uh, one of the bills to um, allow for same-sex marriage in California to pass through the legislature. All right. And, and how much support <laughs> did that uh, bill receive from various groups? Uh, if you, if you look at the um, bill analyses that are prepared in the legislature, there's a list of um, organizations that publicly support and oppose um, bills pending in the legislature. And AB 849, which was, again, one of the uh, bills by um, then Assemblyman Mark Leno, received support from 224 organizations, um, including labor union groups, civil rights groups, local governments and other organizations. And what was the ultimate fate of that bill? Um, as I noted, Governor uh, Schwarzenegger vetoed the, the bill on, on, on constitutional grounds. Now, uh, how do you respond to the argument of Professor Segura that gays and lesbians, lesbians are vulnerable to the initiative process? OK, this is, again, my area of uh, primary uh, study and interest, and I've um, I've looked at this pretty closely over time and, and have developed some pretty well settled views over time um, as well. And it is true that um, in 2000 and 2008, um, the LGBT rights movement, gays and lesbians, lost ballot measure contests um, with respect to the definition of marriage. Um, in California. The first one, Proposition 22, was to codify the definition of, of marriage as being between a man and a woman, as I said, and Proposition 8, as we know, was to um, reinstate that definition in the um, California Constitution. Um, so those are the two times in California where a clearly defined issue that um, gays and lesbians took a position on and it uh, affected them, they were uh, unsuccessful in um, in the, in the initiative or direct democracy context. However, um, California's, uh, California voters have not used the initiative process um, nor the popular referendum uh, to repeal or limit the legislature's other broad expansions of LGBT rights, those that I've just described in some detail, um, as well as the state's very broad domestic partnership law um, in its latest iteration in 2005. 
Um, so it cannot be said that those um, legislative victories were stripped away by the voters through the initiative process. Well, let's say we go back uh, further in history. What is your understanding of the historical uh, examples of when ballot initiatives have come up in California that directly affect uh, the rights of gays and lesbians? Okay, there, there have been a number. Um, probably most notable was um, Proposition 6 in 1978, which was also known as the, the Briggs Initiative. Um, this measure, um, its terms, by its terms, would have allowed public schools to fire teachers, teachers' aides, school administrators, or counselors uh, found to be advocating, imposing, encouraging, or promoting homosexual activity or publicly or indiscreetly engaging in said acts, as publicly and indiscreetly engaging in said acts. What was the vote on uh, that measure? Okay, so there was, there was a, c a contested campaign, and after uh, the election, there was a su successful mobilization against Proposition 6, and the vote was decisive. It was 58% um, no on Proposition 6. In the 1980s, which ballot measures, if any, directly affected the rights of gays and lesbians? Um, so these were three measures that uh, were d directly affected people uh, affected, uh, infected by HIV uh, virus. And uh, the first one was Proposition 64 in 1986. Um, a follow-up measure was Proposition 69 in 1988. Both of these measures, I think they were put on the ballot by Lyndon LaRouche, um, sought to make persons with HIV subject to quarantine and isolation. Um, the voters uh, decisively rejected both of those measures. The first vote in 1986 was a uh, 71% no vote. Uh, the second vote was a 68% no vote. All right. And uh, more recently, uh, what efforts, if any, have there been uh, with respect to California's domestic partnerships in terms of initiatives that might pertain to those? <clears throat> Um, I should say before I talk about domestic partnerships, there was another ballot measure in the 1980s. Uh, this, that was Proposition 102, which would have required doctors, uh, blood banks, and, and other uh, persons to report suspect, uh, persons suspected of having the HIV virus. So this was, again, seen as being uh, discriminatory against uh, persons with HIV, and especially by the, the gay community. Um, and that, the, the voters rejected that measure by, again, a large 65.6% vote. And so just to summarize the initiatives, those are the only three other ones in California that have been on the ballot that um, directly uh, affect uh, LGBT persons, and the California voters have rejected decisively all of those, those three measures. Now, what examples, if any, can you provide of uh, measures that would have directly affected the rights of gays and lesbians but never made it to the ballot. Okay, I described that there was, um, you know, success in the legislature by the LGBT community in, in attaining domestic partnership laws. And there were conservatives in the, um, in the public who certainly opposed that legislation. Um, and there was uh, the potential, certainly, if the public if, if, the, if conservatives thought that the public would support either a repeal through the, public, the popular referendum process or an initiative to repeal um, those domestic partnership benefits, they could have gone to the ballot and done that. But there was no ballot measure to repeal domestic partnership benefits in California. All right. Now, I'd like to uh, switch gears and ask you some questions about developments in other states. And what is the status of hate crimes legislation in the United States today? Uh, so at the state level, there have been 30 states that have adopted um, hate crimes legislation. That's setting aside the recent um, federal legislation. But at the state level, there's in, independently 30 states have adopted at the state level um, hate crime uh, legislation. What is the status of employment discrimination pro prohibitions on the basis of sexual orientation? Okay, this is... Um, an area where you have to look at both the state level and also the local level. At the state level, 21 states have adopted um, across the board um, employment uh, 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 
protections against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and employment. Now, the nine states have adopted, in addition to the 22, another nine states have adopted um, uh, uh, protections against uh, sexual orientation discrimination in public employment. And then, in addition to those states, there have been, at the local level, many um, city and county governments that have adopted um, non-discrimination laws as well. Are those inside or outside of the 21 states that have statewide prohibitions? Okay, in addition to the 21 states with the statewide um, prohibitions, these are outside, and that's 75 additional states, or additional uh, local governments in those states without statewide um, uh, laws in this area have adopted local ordinances to that effect. To what extent, if any, are there legally enforceable contractual guarantees against employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? Okay, as I mentioned, ma many major corporations, as part of their employment policies and practices, have employee handbooks where they um, prohibit um, uh, discrimination in employment on the basis of sexual orientation. And um, in many states, there are uh, enforcement provisions that require um, that those uh, uh, employee-based um, protections be enforced, those contractual inf uh, protections be enforced in court. All right. And what is the status of state employee domestic partnership benefits? Uh, so according to a survey by the Human Rights Campaign, um, over 20 states have uh, adopted uh, state employee domestic partnership benefits at this point. How, in recent years, how have openly gay politicians fared uh, at the ballot box? Uh, this is another example I see where I see sort of a trajectory of increasing success and power by the LGBT rights movement. There's an organization called the Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund, which monitors these things, not only sort of keeps track of how many gay and lesbian, um, openly gay and lesbian candidates uh, are running for office, but also promotes their candidacies. And in uh, 2008, uh, that organization reported that 80 out of 111 openly LGBT candidates were elected to office. And last year, um, this was at the time that the report was, was issued, at least 49 out of 79 openly LGBT candidates were elected to office. What prominent examples of openly uh, gay and lesbian individuals being elected to office can you provide? Uh, I'm, I'm going to object. Uh, this is outside the scope of executive order. Uh, Congress has authority to make these decisions. Uh, but Your Honor, I would respond uh, by saying certainly we would cheerfully stipulate that he didn't know the election results in 2009. I asked Professor Segura about the 2009 election results, and I think to have uh, the most recent information that Professor Segura has already testified to is relevant. And in addition, I reject the characterization that he did not uh, have any opinions about the extensiveness of these laws. Is this not a matter that you can take up on cross-examination? All right, very well. Proceed, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, now let's uh, shift gears and talk about developments at the national level. Uh, how do you respond to Professor Segura's argument that gays and lesbians are politically powerless at the national level? Uh, 
Um, in my view, that's an incorrect assessment. I believe that gays and lesbians do have power at the national level. Please describe recent uh, events in Congress that pertain to your opinion. Uh, so one important event would be the passage in Congress this last year of the Matthew Shepard Hate Crimes um, Act. That's something that has been a priority for the LGBT community for um, some time. And this was um, you know, enacted over some strong opposition in the Congress by uh, the Congress this, this past year. And, and to me, that's a demonstration of political power by the LGBT uh, community. All right. And uh, what other legislation, if any, would you point to that reflects uh, political power of the LGBT community? Okay. So th again, th what I'm describing is what I would call and consider to be uh, upward trajectory of power in, this, in these areas. So a number of priorities for the LGBT community is to uh, repeal the don't ask, don't tell uh, restriction on military service, uh, to repeal the Defense of Marriage Act, um, and um, there have been uh, the Employment Non-Discrimination non Act as well as another important priority. In each of these areas, there's been increased uh, congressional support for um, these legislative uh, objectives. And so if you look at, um, beginning with the, um, the, uh, the Hate Crimes Act, that was legislation that was adopted this past year, um, the uh, Domestic uh, Partnership and Benefits and Obligations Act um, of 2009 is another important one uh, as well. And so in each of these cases, there's been increasing co-sponsorships. The legislation is moving. In, in addition, you've got commitments from um, the leadership of Congress to move forward in these areas and from the President of the United States to support them. So um, on these top priorities of the LGBT community, there's evidence that there is increasing political power um, of that community. Well, let's focus on President Obama. What, if anything, has President Obama done uh, in response to the political goals sought by gays and lesbians? Uh, so the first uh, important act he did in this area was to sign the Matthew Shepard bill. There was a major um, signing ceremony at the White House. Uh, he's also um, appointed openly gay and lesbian uh, members of his administration uh, he, to important positions. Um, he is uh, at a major uh, address at the Human Rights Campaign this past year. He, um, again, uh, asserted his support for the LGBT community and made some commitments about um, his uh, uh, willingness to support their political objectives and his commitment to, um, for example, end Don't Ask, Don't Tell during his administration. So these are um, a few. Uh, some other ones are uh, proclaiming a gay pride month. Um, and others. So in, in, in his first year in office, he, um, the president has um, given evidence of support for the LGBT community. Now, I understand that um, some members of the community are, uh, you know, they don't believe that he's given as much support as, as they think um, he should. But I think by um, an objective standard, you, you would have to say that the president has given um, significant support to the LGBT rights movement. What is your opinion about the level of support that Speaker Nancy Pelosi has extended to the uh, LGBT rights movement? Um, again, I would say that she is an ally of the movement. Um, she has um, consistently supported legislation um, uh, <coughs> to protect the rights of LGBT persons. And um, the, the passage of the Matthew Shepard Act is another example of the speaker being able to move the bill through the, um, the House of Representatives. Okay, uh, now I'd like to shift gears and ask you about trends and trajectories of political power. Um, what, what has been, in the aftermath of Proposition 8, what was the reaction of some of the leading same-sex marriage advocates in California to the trends in public opinion in this area? Okay, so um, obviously the proponents of um, same-sex marriage were um, highly disappointed by the outcome of Proposition 8, but um, there were some in the movement who said we have to um, step back a little bit and look at the progress that we've made. And one of them was 
um, Senator Mark Leno. Um, in an interview, Senator Leno said, quote, we picked up 18 points of support for marriage equality on November 4th. Proponents of Proposition 8 lost 18 points of support. The identical 14 words that were on Proposition 8 were on the ballot in Proposition 22 in 2000. We lost by 22 points in 2000. So in just eight years, we've turned the dial so that we lost by just four percentage points. Our success is in that 18 points, and they're never getting that back. It's only moving in the right direction. What an uncommon phenomenon to be battling this war and to know without a doubt or debate that we will win. Now, please describe trends in public opinion relating to support for the political goals of gays and lesbians. Um, I, to put it in general terms, I would say that um, uh, the public has demonstrated increasing support for the political objectives of LGBT persons, and that can be measured in a number of different ways um, with respect to legal recognition of same-sex relationships, um, for employment non-discrimination. Um, on a wide, ra wide range of issues, the, the polling data indicates increasing public support for non-discrimination and for protection of um, uh, the rights and interests of LGBT persons. What has the uh, Policy Institute of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force Foundation found in this regard? Okay, th this was uh, their analysis of the American National Election Studies data in 2000. This is, a, again, a major um, LGBT uh, rights organization. And in a report analyzing um, the, uh, the National Election Studies data, that organization found that public attitudes toward three key gay and lesbian rights issues have undergone a striking liberalization over the past decade. Public support for adoption rights, the rights of gay men and lesbians to serve in the military, and sexual orientation non-discrimination laws has increased substantially. And that was in 2000, and there's no evidence that that trend has, um, has diminished over time. We've talked today some about political power. What is your definition of political powerlessness? <clears throat> So this uh, definition is drawn from uh, the, Cle the Supreme Court's decision in Cleburne from 1985. And by that definition, political powerlessness indicates no ability to attract the attention of the lawmakers. What is your opinion about the appropriateness of the Supreme Court's use of that test? Well, in, this was a... a Okay. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what is your bottom line conclusion about whether gays and lesbians have the ability to attract attention of lawmakers in California? In my view, um, the, the evidence that we've just gone through and discussed indicates that um, gays and lesbians have the ability to attract the attention of lawmakers in California. And what is your bottom line conclusion as to whether gays and lesbians have the ability to attract attention of lawmakers nationally at the federal level? Again, um, surveying the evidence, um, it is my opinion that gays and lesbians have the ability to attract the attention of lawmakers at the federal level as well. There are under no further questions. Very well. Weiss, you may cross-examine.
Good afternoon, Professor Miller, and it is now afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, you identified early in your examination a number of what you referred to as allies of the uh, gay and lesbian community. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Uh, now, are all of those uh, individuals and organizations and groups that you identified um, allies of African American rights? I would have to go back and, and think. I, I can't think of anyone that are not, put it that way. Oh, we've got the Democratic Party and organized labor, elected officers, large corporations, newspapers, celebrities, churches and faith-based organizations and professionals. Those would, are all I would, allies. I would, say, I would say that all of those organizations and, and would support um, rights for African Americans, yes. And would support rights for women, correct? That's correct and would support rights for racial minorities other than African Americans, correct? And would support rights for Native Americans, correct? Correct. Now, despite all those allies, um, Proposition 8 uh, did pass, correct? Yes, it passed. Now, do you have, a, um, do you have an opinion as to whether if the California legislature and the California governor were able to do so, that they would have enacted legislation that permitted gay and lesbian marriage? Well, the legislature voted to that effect, and so my view is that uh, most likely they would have done it if they had the constitutional ability to do so. The governor um, has um, indicated that he supports um, same-sex marriage. So under those circumstances, it um, would seem so. But again, it's somewhat hypothetical because we don't, we don't actually know. We were operating under one set of rules, and I would have to speculate a little bit as to what the outcome would be were it not for um, Prop 22. Yes, and, and it may be that because of that, you don't have an opinion on the issue. But... Um, what I'm doing is I'm asking you, um, as somebody who has been brought into this court as an expert by the defendants, uh, whether you have an opinion as to whether in the absence of Proposition 8 um, uh, and in the absence of Proposition 22, there would be legal gay and lesbian marriage in California today. I, I think it's easier to answer for the legislature than for the governor. I think for the legislature, it's pretty clear that the legislature would, this legislature would um, enact gender neutral um, marriage laws in California. For the governor, it's a little harder to say, but given his public statements in support of same-sex marriage, I think it's probably fair to say that he would have signed that legislation. Okay. Um, now, uh, is, it, is it fair to say that uh, you've gotten a lot more information about this area than you had at the time your deposition was taken? Um, I've done uh, further investigation of these, measure, of these matters uh, in the past six weeks. Yes, that's true. Um, uh, for example, uh, at your deposition, um, you did not know how many states had laws prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in employment, housing, and public accommodations. Correct, sir? Uh, part of the problem in my answer to that question was I didn't know what the definition that the uh, questioner was, was using, whether he was speaking about statewide um, uh, legislation or whether that could include local legislation as well. So I, um, indicated on my direct examination. There are many states that do not have statewide uh, protections but have local municipalities and local governments that provide uh, protection in those areas. Sir, let me direct your attention to page 197 of your deposition, which uh, is tab uh, one of your binders. Sorry, which tab is it? One. Okay, I don't have tab one. I've got binder two and three. Okay. 
and, and which page is it? Page 197, um, line, lines 18, 23. Question. I was asking about protection from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And to be more specific, I'll say in employment, housing, public accommodations. Answer. Okay, phrase that way, I haven't done an investigation and couldn't say. Did you give that testimony under yes. oath, sir? Yes, I did. Provide the context of the prior question and answer, uh, where he was asked on line seven, in how many states has the state legislature not enacted a law protecting gays and lesbians from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? And he answered, I would be surprised again. I'm not to pre prepared to make conclusions on the legislation of all the 50 states, but given what I know about the advancement of things like adoption laws, domestic partnership laws, marriage in some states, I think it would be like be unlikely that there are more than half the states where there are no protections for gays and lesbians. But again, I would like to take a closer look. Thank you. And you had not taken that closer look at the time of your deposition, correct, sir? Uh, that's correct. Um, uh, and indeed, um, uh, going back to the uh, question and answer immediately before what your counsel just read, going back to line 22 on page 196, Question, in how many states is there no state law providing for protection from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? Answer, I think that was already asked and answered, as I recall. Question, I may have forgotten your answer. You don't know the number? Answer, I don't know the number, yeah. I apologize, you're gonna to have to point me again to the, the line that we're at. Line 22, page 196. Okay. Is that testimony under oath at your deposition, sir? I'm, I'm, I wasn't following you, so I'm going to have to read it through again. I'm sure. sorry. Um, page 196, line 22. You have that? Yes, I do. Question. In how many states is there no state law providing for protection from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? Answer. I think that was already asked and answered, as I recall. Question. I may have forgotten your answer. You don't know the number? Answer. I don't know the number. Yeah. Did you give that testimony under oath at your deposition? Uh, that's my testimony. I, I did you, have sir. in my report um, information about uh, state level uh, uh, protections of this type. And my, my pro part of the problem was I wasn't sure about local uh, non-discrimination laws. And, yes. so and, you, and you didn't say that at the deposition, did you, sir? No, I did not. No. Um, and, um, and again, what you do understand that I'm focusing on not on what somebody wrote in your report or what was on those slides that you read. I'm focusing on what was in your mind at the time of your deposition, the answers that you gave at your deposition. You understand that's what I'm asking you about? Yes, and what I wrote in my report is something I investigated myself. Investigated yourself? Yes, I did. And you didn't go over it with counsel at all? Is that your testimony? Not that part. I didn't discuss that part of my report with counsel. What parts did you discuss with counsel? Objection, Your Honor. We have a stipulation in this case entered by the court indicating that communications between counsel and expert witnesses are not to be inquired into, and these, this line of questions is violative of the court's order. Your Honor, he opened the door. He was the one that said, I investigated it myself. He's the one that, that made the assertion that this was all his work product. In the absence of that, I would agree with counsel, but he can't have it both ways. Well, Your Honor, he, he, he made the statement he had no communication whatsoever uh, in response to a question by Mr. Boyce, who had in, inferred that, oh, you're, you're reading something someone else had written. So I, I think this is inconsistent with the statement. Well, I think it's appropriate for counsel to object to communications that the witness had with counsel, but I do think the witness has also opened up the door to the issue of what it is that he himself investigated and what he did not personally investigate. And I believe that was the, the tenor of Mr. Boyce's it question. Was, it was exactly, Your Honor. And no objection to that, Your Honor. I investigated everything that was in my report. I beg your pardon, sir. I investigated everything that was in my report. Now, personally. Personally right? investigated. For example, uh, every um, every statement in there is something that you personally investigated. Is that true?
I believe that's true, yes. Um, uh, for example, um, in, your, um, in your rebuttal report, Uh, you cite a number of documents. I don't have my rebuttal report in front of me. I don't know. Uh, it's tab number two. And... Um, at the end, you have an index of materials considered. Correct, sir? That's correct. And um, uh, were some of these uh, materials provided you by counsel? Or did you find all of them yourself? Uh, most of these I found by myself. Uh, That's my question, sir. Remember my question? I'm Sure. Were all of these materials materials that you found yourself, or were some of them provided you by counsel? Some of them were provided for me by counsel. I found most of them myself. Now, um, would you, um, on the index of materials considered, Index of materials considered. I, I, yeah, I have it here. Um, would you just go down and, and they're numbered, right? Yes, they are. Uh, would you go down and just circle the ones that were um, that you found yourself were not provided by counsel? Just circle the ones you found yourself. Circle the number. Moving through this, but I'm having some difficulty with some of the ones. Um, can't recall whether I found them or whether uh, they were provided by counsel. I didn't put a question mark next to those.
Okay, I've looked through it. Very much. Your Honor, could counsel approach? We could both approach and just take a look. Um, let me just ask a clarifying question. Yes. Um, what does the Numbers 161 through 172. You have put question marks next to them, and then you've drawn a line down them. Can I ask you to explain what that means? Yes, m most of the question marks, I, mean, I can't recall one way or the other whether um, I individually f found that myself or whether I first received it from counsel. On those, um, it, I, I don't remember seeing anything that said Form 990 on it that I investigated myself, and so I put those uh, as on question marks. Those are things I did not um, find myself. Okay. And 
I think it is clear, but just to be, be certain, um, uh, where you've drawn the line around 233 through 237, that's meant to mean they're all question marks. Yeah, you'll, you'll be seeing more of those as I was trying to move things along. Sure. Okay. I think that's a um, easy way to do it, and I think understandable. Um, so the 259 through 271 are questions. Two seventy two. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Honor at a break, we'll mark that as a deposition so the record is clear. Very well, that'll be marked. Uh those pages as what PX 794A would that be yes. a fair designation PX 794A now at the time of your deposition um, you were not aware of how many of the ten most populous states had no state law protecting gays and lesbians from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation correct sir I didn't know how many had statewide laws, no. Um, and um, when you say you didn't know how many had statewide laws, um, um, let me ask you to look at page 193 of the deposition. And um, lines 17 through 21, question, of the 10 most populous states in the United States, how many have no state law protecting gays and lesbians from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? I don't know the answer to that question. Did you give that testimony under oath as your deposition? Uh, <clears throat> again. Please begin with a yes or no answer, sir. Well, that was my answer, yes. But again, that, there was some confusion as to what the, the term, I had some confusion as to what the term was that, that uh, Mr. Goldman was using. You ask him to clarify it? Well, I think we, we had a couple of uh, back and forths about, about that. Um, and I said that I thought there were some, uh, if, if we included adoption provisions, in, et cetera, and um, I wasn't quite clear as to what he was referring to. And I probably should have, in that at that moment in the deposition gone back and asked for additional clarification but at that point I just said I didn't know well, sir um, um, you can you can look at the pages immediately preceding this if you want um, is there any point on page 193 or 192 or going back to 191 or 190 um, you, you talk about adoption um, uh, you talk about adoption on page 190, right? Question. Um, question. At page se at line 7 of 190. I understand that, but you just told me there is no state in which there are no protections for gays and lesbians. And I'm, and I'm asking you what you have in mind, where there are no <coughs> protections in the basis no protections against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. No hate crime statutes for perceived sexual orientation. What protections are there that you have in mind? Answer. Well, it would include a wide range of things in terms of allowing sex couples to adopt children. Just sort of looking through the protections that are available in California in page 15 and 16. This is a long list. I recognize that California has broader protections than many states, but I can't say with certainty in response to your question that there's any state that has no equivalent to any of these protections. You gave that testimony, correct? Yes, I did. Then, when you were asked on page 193, question, of the 10 most populous states in the United States, how many have no state law protecting gays and lesbians from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? And you said, I don't know the answer to that question. There wasn't any issue about whether you were talking about statewide laws or not, correct? 
Well, in, in the phrasing of the question, he doesn't say uh, one way or the other. You don't, and you don't ask him? No, I probably should have. Um, now, let me, just, let me just be sure I have your testimony. Um, if the question had been, of the ten most populous states in the United States, how many have no statewide law protecting gays and lesbians from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? Would you have had an answer to that question? I'm not sure that I would have had a, a, an answer to that question on the top ten. I think when we were talking about uh, is it more than 20, less than 20, those kinds of things, that's where I had confusion as to uh, uh, how many states had protections against uh, discrimination? I, I was thinking in terms of the, the local level as well as the statewide level. And, you, and your answer here was that you didn't know the answer. To right. which question? Either question. You didn't, know the, you didn't know the answer to either of those questions at your deposition, did you? But the questions with respect to the top ten states? I yes. did not know. Okay. Um, and you've just gone through the material that you relied on, and None of those materials provide the information that is on demonstrative 33, correct? That's incorrect. Okay. Um, uh, which um, of the uh, materials that you relied on uh, provide that uh, employment discrimination prohibition is in 21 states and 75 localities in remaining states have protections? 21 states is information provided by the Human Rights Campaign. And I think where, I, where is that in your uh, list of things relied on? Let me see if I can find it. Tab 2. Are you referring to uh, number 195, 196, or 194? Each of which is a human rights campaign. No, I, I think I had it wrong. I, I meant the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Um, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. That's what you meant? Uh, I'm trying to remember where I got that information about the, um, uh, the 21 states. It's in my report. It was something I considered um, at the time. I could go back to the report if I had it here. Here it is. The report yeah. is there. What I'm asking is where you got that information. It should, it should be in the report. Paragraph 99 of the report. And I was going through the Human Rights Campaign website, and there's a, um, a link to uh, laws and elections, and that's where I found the information about uh, the non-discrimination laws. And what it says here, as well as other civil union laws, dom domestic partnership, these are grouped together on the Human Rights Campaign website. And so there's some confusion to me as to what we're talking about because they've got these different maps of the United States with um, states coded by color as to whether they have particular um, uh, protections for gays and lesbians. And, and what did you do to try to resolve that confusion? Uh, well, I, I noted it in my report as clearly as I could, and um, breaking them out, I think I said, I could read it for you in 99. You don't have to read number 99. The question is, do you, do you say in 99 that there's confusion? No, I say um, 31 states in the District of Columbia have adopted laws punishing hate crimes. 21 states in the District of Columbia have adopted laws to prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Oh, I'm sorry. 
and, and to move things along. It's not necessary to read it into the record. Well, I'm my, trying to be responsive. My, my question. Yes. You said there was confusion. Do you recall that? I was confused about the question because there's various different states have various different laws with respect to protections on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, let, me, let me try to put a question that hopefully will not be confusing. You recognize that in certain states with protection of, against discrimination against minorities, some of those states do not provide protection for gays and lesbians or provide narrower protection for gays and lesbians. Correct? I'm sorry. I thought there might be a double negative. Can you repeat that? Sure. Um, maybe the best way to do it is to direct your attention to your deposition. Okay. Page 198. Line 22. Uh, question. Do you know whether in many places where laws prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation, the protections are narrower than laws in the same jurisdiction that prohibit discrimination on the basis of race or sex? Answer, can you define what you mean by narrower? Question, for example, they may cover fewer forms or air arenas of potential discrimination. They may cover fewer actors. They may be subject to broader exceptions. Those would be some examples. Answer, so I haven't looked closely at these other states to be able to form an opinion as to whether the protections for gays and lesbians in those states where they are available are narrower than for other minority groups. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And did you give that testimony under oath at your deposition? Yes, I did. Now, you talked about um, the extent to which gays and lesbians had been elected to office in your direct testimony. Do you remember that? Yes. And at your deposition, you recall being asked whether or not gays and lesbians are underrepresented in elected office nationwide? Uh, I believe I was asked that, yes. And do you recall that you didn't know the answer to that at that time? Uh, I remember that I didn't have <coughs> uh, a good answer um, to give because it's a, it's, it's a difficult question, actually. And do you have an answer for that today? Um, I can explain why it's a difficult question for me to answer. No, um, I, I don't need you to explain why you don't have an answer. Um, I, I'm simply uh, trying to find out if you do have an answer. I have an answer, yeah, I guess. Are they under underrepresented today? I think my answer is I don't know because it's difficult to figure out either the numerator or the denominator if we're thinking about whether the group is um, has <clears throat> what what the ratio is between gays and lesbians in public office and gays and lesbians in the United States? Well, sir, take California. Um, you know that no openly gay or lesbian person has ever in the history of the state been elected to statewide office, correct, sir? No openly gay person, that's, that's correct. Uh, not governor, not lieutenant governor, not attorney general, not senator. Correct, sir? That's correct. So in that case, whatever the denominator would be, the numerator would be zero, correct? That's correct. Now, you talked about um, what you referred to as the upward trajectory um, of gays and lesbians. Actually, you referred to it as the LGBT, LGBT community. Do you recall that? Uh, in our, my testimony today? Yes. Yes. And in fact, throughout your testimony, you were referring 
to the LGBT community, correct? That's correct. Um, is that a term that um, you use at all in your expert report? I don't recall. Um, uh, I believe so. You do believe so? I would have to go back and look at it. Maybe when we take a break, you can go back and see how many times, if at all, you use that term. Uh, do you, have you ever used that term in any of your academic writings? Out of my writings, in my classes, I do. Um, do you ever use that term in your deposition? LGBT? I don't recall. Um, uh, let me go back to the national uh, uh, level. Um, you referred to don't ask, don't tell. Do you recall that? Yes. And gays and lesbians are still being discharged from the military under the don't ask, don't tell rule, correct? Yes, I believe it's in lesser numbers, but it's still, it's still correct, yes. And um, is there any other minority uh, in this country that you can identify um, that is discharged for the, from the military when they're doing a perfectly good job just because somebody discovers their status? I don't know how we would define minority in that case. Well, in your testimony, you were talking about discrimination against minorities, right. correct? Right. Now, using minority the way you were using it in your testimony, um, is there any other minority that is discharged from the mil military when they're doing a perfectly good job just because somebody discovers their status? I'd have to say I'm not aware of any. Um, now, you uh, also mentioned the Defense of Marriage Act, remember? Correct. And uh, uh, the Defense of Marriage Act has not been repealed, correct? That's correct. Uh, and you would recognize that as a significant piece of uh, legislation that is against the interests of the LGBT community, correct? Yes, I would, I would guess that the majority of the LGBT community would want, uh, would support the repeal of, of uh, DOMA, yes. Now, uh, indeed, you say you would guess that. Um, uh, as an expert, would it be your opinion that a majority of the LGBT community uh, would like to see DOMA repealed? That's my opinion, yes. Um, now, even though you may not be an expert in the area, you are aware that historically in this country there has been severe prejudice and discrimination against gays and lesbians, correct? Yes, I'm aware of that. And I uh, since you did begin studying this in the 1970s, you're aware that that discrimination had continued into the period that you've actually studied, correct, sir? That's correct. Now, you um, were asked at your deposition about the term gay bashing. Do you recall that? Yes. And you said you were familiar with that term, correct? Yes. And what does that mean to you? Um. I think most times when I've heard the term, it's, it's been used to describe um, insults against gay and lesbian people. It can also be used to uh, describe physical violence against gay and lesbian people. Uh, when did you um, come to realize that that term could be described or used to describe uh, physical violence against gay and lesbian people? I, th I think I've always known that it can be. I think it's more often than not, in my experience, used to describe insults and physical violence. We have just a moment, Your Honor. Well.
We asked you to look at page 39 of your deposition. Beginning on line 22. Yes. Question. Are you familiar with the term gay bashing? Answer. I've heard that term before, yes. Question. What is your understanding of what that term means? Answer. Again, I, go, I, I don't know if this is a dictionary definition of the term, but my understanding would be I don't think it means physical violence against gays. I think it means pejorative statements, maybe ad hominem attacks against gay and lesbian persons. Answer, or question, can it include physical violence as well? Answer, again, it seems like it would given the term. It seems like bashing has a sense of violence to it. But I guess in the way I've heard it in conversation, it would be it's more used for sort of verbal attacks as opposed to physical attack. Did you give that testimony under oath at your deposition? Yes, I did. Now, at your deposition, uh, you were asked some questions about prejudice against gays and lesbians, correct? Uh, yes. Um, and um, you were asked <coughs> questions and you gave these answers. And page 34, line yep. 18. Thank you. Uh, question. What academic books or articles are you familiar with that deal with prejudice against minority groups? Answer. I'm not thinking of titles that I can name for you. Yeah. You mean you can't think of any titles? No, I can't. Answer. No, I can't. No. Did you give that testimony at your deposition? Yes, I did. Um, now, uh, today, you are familiar with some academic books or articles dealing with minority groups, prejudice, correct? That's right. And did that come from research that you did between your deposition and today? No, I, I think I listed a number of these authors in my deposition, actually. I, I think I was near, uh, interpreting that question narrowly to be a book specifically about um, prejudice. And I think there are a lot of books that address the problem of prejudice without having that in the title, for example. The question said, what academic books or articles are you familiar with that deal with prejudice against minority groups? Correct? That's correct, yes. You believe um, that a law prohibiting same-sex sexual conduct intimacy between gays and lesbians, a law prohibiting that, would reflect prejudice against gays and lesbians? Well, it's not, first of all, it's not a law I would vote for. Um, I would vote to repeal. I don't know what the law, the purposes of such a law would be. Um, I can't think of any um, good basis for such a law. As for the definition of prejudice, we'd have to um, look at that more closely. Well, your definition of prejudice um, was given in your deposition, correct? That's, I give a definition in the, defini in the deposition, yes. And your definition of prejudice is an unfair judgment against an individual or group, correct? Uh, that was a general definition that I offered, yes. That was your definition as a political scientist, correct? It's consistent with um, generally how political scientists think about the, this problem. Not only was it consistent with how generally political sciences, scientists would define it, it was your definition, correct? That's the definition I offered. Yes. Now, um, using prejudice in that way, um, 
does a law that prohibits same-sex sexual conduct reflect prejudice against gays and lesbians, as you use that term? Uh, as being an unfair judgment. Um, again, I, I can't speak to what was in the minds of the lawmakers um, in that instance. There might have been uh, a range of different reasons why they would enact that law, which could include moral disapproval of certain sexual activities. It could have a, had other um, uh, bases. And if there was no um, sort of uh, uh, supportable basis for that law, then I would think it would be pay, uh, prejudice, but I would have to know what the basis that the lawmakers offered were, was for that bill. So sitting here without any more context, you can't say, in your opinion, whether a law prohibiting sexual conduct between people of the same sex would or would not constitute prejudice, correct? Again, there's something I wouldn't support, but I, I can't say whether it would constitute prejudice or not without knowing more. Okay. Um, um, you, you do re recall that there was time in this country where a number of states had that, those laws to criminalize homosexual activity, correct? Well, there are sodomy laws that criminalized uh, sexual activity for both homosexuals and heterosexuals. And I, I know that those were, there were still some of those laws in place before the Supreme Court struck them down, yes. And there were laws that simply prohibited homosexual activity and did not prohibit the exact same act performed by heterosexuals, correct? There were states that had those laws. Well, I'm aware of at least one state, which was Texas. That's my understanding of um, the Texas statute. And the reason you're familiar with the Texas statute is that was what was involved in Lawrence v. Texas, correct? Correct. Um, now, at the time that um, uh, Lawrence was decided, how many states had laws that would criminalize sexual conduct between homosexuals? I don't know the exact number. I know it was declining after the um, Bowers versus Hardwick decision, but I, I don't know the exact number. Uh, does uh, 25 states at the time of Bowers and 13 states at the time of Lawrence sound about right to you, sir? Approximately correct. And again, I don't know how many were um, covered both heterosexual and um, uh, activity as well as only um, homosexual sexual activity. You know that all of those states criminalized homosexual activities, correct? Some did for heterosexual as well. Uh, and focus on my question, sir. And, and yes, and some did heterosexual as well. I'm not f focusing on heterosexual right now. I'm focusing on, focusing on homosexual activity. All of those states prohibited homosexual activity and criminalized it, correct? Yes, and some did for heterosexual activity as well. I, I give the Your answer Honor, yes. Can, can, I, can I ask the, that the witness be... Why don't you answer the question directly? Mr. Thompson can bring out any additional facts that he thinks is necessary in order to put this answer in context. But counsel is entitled to a direct I, answer to a, a direct question. As I said two or three times, the answer is yes. Now, gays and lesbians were barred from federal employment for a long period of time, correct? Um, starting after World War II for some period of time, yes. Good. Your Honor, we're, we're now going well beyond the scope of the witness's expertise. We haven't tendered him as a, a historical expert on the history of discrimination. This was covered by Professor Chauncey. Your Honor, um, I, I think that, that objection has some merit to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, then, I'll sustain it. It was too hard for me to resist. And I, uh, um, um, uh, speaking of Professor Chauncey, um, uh, Dr. Miller, uh, have you read any books by Professor Chauncey? No, I have not. 
You know who Professor Chauncey is, do you, or not? Not really, no. Um, no, he's a witness. He's been a witness in this case, but I haven't read his work. Um, uh, do you know who um, uh, Miriam Smith is? Uh, no. And never read anything by Miriam Smith? No, I have not. Um, do you know who Shane Phelan is? Um, I don't recall that name, no. Uh, do you know who Ellen Regal is? Again, I do not uh, recall that name. Uh, or Barry Tadlock? Same answer. Um, are you familiar with a book uh, entitled Gays and Lesbians in the Democratic Process, Public Policy, Public Opinion, and Political Representation? I may have heard of that book, but I have not read that book. Um, you mentioned uh, Professor uh, Estridge before. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, what books, if any, have you read by him? Um, I've read part of, I believe the name of the, the book is Gay Law by Professor Eskridge. I've also read his Constitutional Law casebook. Um, Anything else? The only thing in the books that I can recall. Um, you uh, also mentioned um, uh, Dr. Pinello. Do you recall yes, that? Yes, yes. Uh, what books have you read by him? Uh, I can't recall the title of the book. He was on one of the panels that I was on, and I remember reading some of his work at that point, but I can't remember the titles. Was some of his work a book or an article or a paper, or what was it? It was What I'd read was a working paper at the working time. Working paper. Yeah. So you've never read any article by him or any book by him? I, I think I've read some articles by him, but I can't recall the titles. Um, do you know... Have you ever read any books by Mark Blasius, B-L-A-S-I-U-S? Uh, no, I have not. You know who he is? A scholar, but I haven't read his work. Um, do you know what he's a scholar in? Um, he, LGBT issues, I think, is he's known for. When did you discover that Professor Blasius was a scholar in this area? Uh, this was after my deposition. This was a name I hadn't heard of, and so after, I, after my deposition, I, I took a look. Um, uh, do you know who Irvashe Vad is? Another, she's another scholar. Um, I think she's in New York, does work in this area. Have you ever read any of her work? No, I have not. Um, and um, when did you discover that she was a scholar in this area? That was the same thing after my deposition. That was a name that was mentioned, and I took a look. Name mentioned in your deposition, you were asked about it, and you didn't know who that was, right? Yeah. I, I may, have, may have heard her name in the past, but I couldn't recall the deposition. Um, one name that you did mention uh, at your deposition was Andrew Sullivan. Do you recall that? Uh, what books have you read by Mr. Sullivan? Uh, a book that I've read and I've assigned to students is um, Same Sex Marriage Pro and Con, a reader. Um, I've read parts of Virtually Normal, but not the whole book. Virtually Normal? Parts, but not the whole book. That's correct. Uh, would it be fair to say you read the entire book that you assigned to your students? Yes. Uh, and that's a collection of, um, of articles and pieces, correct? Yeah, he's, he writes, he's written some of the um, articles, and he's got a range of um, different writers who contribute to a, a robust discussion of this issue. And he's also written books himself, correct? Yes. Read any of those books? As I said, I've read, read part of Virtually Normal, but not the, not the whole book. And, and, no, and no other parts of any other books? By Andrew Sullivan? Yes. Not that I can recall, no. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you about another person, and I'm going to spell his last name because I'm not sure I pronounce it right. It's uh, John D. Apostrophe E. M. I. L. I. O. You familiar who he is? Yes, I am. And um, he is a scholar in this area, correct? That's correct. And um, have you read his books? No, I have not. 
You know he has written books, correct? Yes, I do. He's a well-known scholar in this area. You haven't read his books? That's correct. Have you read any articles by him? I may have. I can't recall the titles. Um, is it your opinion that one of the factors that you would look at in determining the political power of a minority group is the extent to which that minority group is experiencing discrimination? I think that would be uh, a factor I would look at, yes. And have you looked at that um, for what you refer to as the LGBT community? Yes, I have. And um, are there examples of discrimination against gays and lesbians at the present time, within the last you know, several years, not going back into the ancient history, but in the time that you say that you're an expert in? Um, are there examples of discrimination against gays and lesbians? Um. So, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the restricted ability to serve in the, in the military um, could be described as discrimination against yes. gays and lesbians, yes. Any other examples oh. of discrimination against gays and lesbians in what you refer to as the modern period? Um. That would cer certainly be the, the, the prominent one in terms of legally in enforced uh, uh, discrimination, in my view, which is um, there could be there could be private discrimination, which is I have no way of knowing how much uh, private discrimination there is. But in terms of, like you mentioned, federal employment, that there was a time where gays and lesbians were banned from federal employment. That's been um, that re that's been repealed, and many other laws like that, which created official discrimination against gays and lesbians have been uh, repealed, whereas the military situation is different. Um, I, I want to be sure I understand what you're saying. Um, you're saying that there is official discrimination, um, like the don't ask, don't tell po policy, correct? Um, That's what you refer to as official discrimination. And it's legally um, enforced rules that have a uh, uh, effect on gays and lesbians, which is different than, than um, heterosexual people, yes. That's what you refer to as official discrimination? Is that true? I'm just trying to get your word. Yeah, well, I'm, 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 I'm maybe legal is a, is a better word, it's de, or de jure, I don't know how you want to describe it, in various different ways to say the same thing. What word is the word you use? Because I just want to use your language. Okay, official would be fine. Official, okay. okay. And by official discrimination, you mean discrimination that is legally enforced, discrimination by the state, correct? I think that's fair to say, yeah. Now, are you aware of any of what you call official discrimination against gays and lesbians uh, in this country today other than the don't ask, don't tell policy? No, I'm just I'm trying to think of of um, other laws now, um, or f official uh, policies that uh, discriminate on that basis. Now, one you know, obviously, I, I think what you're looking at is you know, one thing would be the the DOMA policy, right? And um, there you go. Okay, so I know, and I, I know, <laughs> I, I know that's what you're getting at, right? Right, right. That, that'd be another example. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, what other examples? Well, I mean, I think the DOMA policy would be um, something where it's a question as to what the nature of the discrimination is. But there's a differential treatment between same-sex couples and um, and heterosexual couples under right. that law. Okay. Yes. Uh, and. What other examples of official discrimination are you aware of?
I can't think of at this time any other uh, de jure or official laws that discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, are you aware now? now and, and, and just so the question is clear, are you talking now at the federal level? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, now let me shift to the state level. Okay. Um, um, at the state level, uh, what uh, official discrimination against gays and lesbians are you aware of? Well, the military. Um, I actually don't know how National Guard units work, if that's considered federal or state. Um, so I would guess that there would be comparable restrictions in that area. Um, in terms of uh, other laws that would you know, officially discriminate at the state level against gays and lesbians, there, there might be an absence of non-discrimination laws, but in terms of the government officially discriminating uh, itself, um, on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, again, if uh, we're looking at the institution of marriage, then uh, the, the state does treat uh, heterosexual couples differently than, than same-sex couples. Yes. And um, if you're looking at adoption, some states uh, treat um, uh, heterosexuals differently than homosexuals, correct? Um, it's a more complicated area of law. I think there's more uh, discretion uh, by individual judges. I think that only a couple of states have statewide policies that actually uh, restrict adoption. Now, Arkansas is an example where uh, the restriction is on unmarried couples. So that could be either heterosexual or same sex. Yes, but in Arkansas, they put that in at the same time that they put in a law that said the gays and lesbians couldn't marry, correct? Yeah, but I, that's correct. But also, so so yeah. it means that because gays and lesbians can't marry, by definition, they're not going to be a married person, so they can't adopt, correct? Effect is correct, but it also applies to heterosexual couples as well. well except heterosexual couples can marry, correct? They can't they can in marry. In Arkansas. Yeah, but it is a restriction on them that they would have to marry in order to adopt. Right. And... Um, and gays and lesbians can't marry, so they can't adopt, correct? That's the current law. Um, now, are you aware of discrimination against gays and lesbians today that does not fall into what you refer to as official discrimination? In terms of private discrimination, it was, is that what you're getting at? or? Uh, again, let me just be sure I understand what your uh, words mean. For you, private discrimination is any discrimination that is not codified into law, correct? That's the distinction I was drawing out. Okay. Yes. okay. Using private discrimination the way that you use it, uh, are you aware of examples of private discrimination against gays and lesbians? Well, I know there, there are lots of cases that are brought um, against, for example, employers for sexual orientation discrimination and there are avenues for pursuing um, anti-discrimination claims against employers. So obviously there are uh, cases of private discrimination currently in the United States and to some extent those are um, uh, uh, gay and lesbian people who are discriminated on that basis can get redress through administrative agencies or the courts. So yes, I'm aware that there are, is ongoing discrimination in the United States. And have you uh, tried to investigate the extent of that at all? Uh, not private discrimination, no. Um, um, let me ask you to um, uh, we give the Williams Institute binder. I'm going to ask you to look at a binder of um, exhibits while that's being handed out. Let me ask, are you familiar with the Williams Institute? Yes, I am. When did you become familiar with the Williams Institute? Uh, several years ago. It's at UCLA. And um, uh, you just answered my next question, which was, where is the Williams Institute? It's, <laughs> it's at, UCLA. at UCLA, yes. And um, uh, what does the Williams Institute do? Uh, thank you. 
I know it promotes research on um, issues pertaining to gays and lesbians and um, provides funding for research in that area. It may have other parts of its mission, but that's the one that I'm most familiar with. Um, uh, let me ask you to uh, look at tab B, Science Exhibit 604. Tab what? Tab B, as in boy. Um, this is in the new binder that was just given up. Well. Um, and this is um, testimony uh, given by R. Bradley Sears, September 23, 2009 to the Committee on Education and Labor of the United States House of Representatives, uh, which I would ask the court to take judicial notice of. No objection, Your Honor. Well. Um, have you ever reviewed this uh, testimony, sir? No, I've not. Um, do you know who R. Bradley Sears is? Um, I'm not familiar with him, no. Um, um, let me ask you to uh, turn to the very last page. And, um, and the last paragraph, after having talked about various research the Williams Institute has done, says, based on this research, as well as the research I have just discussed, we conclude, one, there is widespread and persistent pattern of unconstitutional discrimination against LGBT state government employees as well as local government employees. Two, there is no meaningful difference in the pattern and scope of employment discrimination against LGBT people by state governments compared to what is found in the private sector or in federal or local government. And three, the list of documented examples that we have compiled far underrepresents the actual prevalence of employment discrimination against LGBT people by state and local governments. Do you have any reason to disagree with those conclusions? Having not done any research in this area, I don't have any basis for um, disagreeing with those conclusions. Um, Uh, let me ask you to look be at uh, behind tab C, Plaintiff's Exhibit 605. Um, This is the beginning of the report that Mr. Spears referred to. Um, um, and I would ask the court to take judicial notice of Plaintiff's Exhibit 605. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. Um, and you will see that the, uh, the report at the bottom of this first page, essentially repeats what Mr. Spears had told Congress. Do you see that? It seems to be substantially the same, at least, yes. Um, uh, have you ever uh, reviewed this at all? No, I have not. Um, um, let me ask you to look at page two. And the second bold headline there says, Courts and legal scholars have concluded that sexual orientation is not related to an individual's ability to contribute to society or perform in the workplace. You see that? I, I see that sentence, yes. Do you agree with that conclusion, sir? Objection, Your Honor. This is beyond the scope of the witness's expertise. He's a political scientist. Your Honor, here I, I, I don't think the objection is well taken. Um, uh, one of the issues here 
is he says that discrimination is an element of political power. One of the elements of discrimination is if you're treated differently, even though you are capable of performing the task, that is, um, uh, different treatment of like people is the best way to prove discrimination. And the first element of that is to prove that they are like people. Like so many of the <coughs> documents that have been shown to uh, those who have provided expert testimony in this case, I think this is very much of the same vein. It is a statement and it is being used in order to obtain the reaction of the witness to uh, the statement. And I think it's an appropriate line of inquiry, and therefore uh, the court having taken judicial notice of the document, uh, I think the line of inquiry is an appropriate one, and the objection will be overruled. Have the question in mind, sir? I, I do, yes. Um, I, I haven't looked closely to see if there are any examples where sexual orientation would uh, be a factor in terms of uh, uh, the workplace. I can't think of any, and so um, in general, I think I would uh, not have any objection to this statement. Um, let me ask you to look next at um, tab D. Um, and this is the first chapter of the um, Williams uh, Institute report. Yes. Mark each chapter with a separate exhibit number. But I would ask the court to take judicial notice at this time of plaintiff's exhibits 606, 607, 608, 609, 610, 611, 612, 613, 614, 615, 616, 616, 16. 617, 618, 619, and 620 are the um, 15 chapters of the Williams Institute report, the um, introduction of which has already been uh, no objection, taken no. judicial notice of. Very well. And that included 608. That was one of the ones you mentioned. Yes, it was, Your Honor. I think it was... Um, 608 through 620. Well, you may proceed. Um, now, have you uh, reviewed any portion of this prior to today, sir? go to which tab? Uh, it goes through tab R as in Robert. I've seen any of these before today. Um, let me ask you to turn to tab Q. That's exhibit 619. After talking about how the United States Supreme Court has recognized irrational discrimination is often signaled by indi indicators of bias, um, and talking about unsubstantiated factors, 
not being permissible basis for government decision making. The report says, quote, this concern has special applicability to widespread and persistent negative attitudes toward gay and transgender minorities. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, do you have any reason to disagree with the report that there is widespread and persistent negative attitudes toward gay and transgender minorities? Reading the, uh, the paragraph again. <coughs> Probably fair to say that that's true, although I would add a caveat that I, I think both of those um, <clears throat> terms, widespread and persistent, are um, especially widespread, is, is declining over time. But it is still, as of the date of this report, which was, I think, 2009, was still widespread and persistent, correct? I think there's a scale of widespread and a scale of persistent, and it used to be worse, and it's not as bad now. you um, uh, compare the political power of gays and lesbians today with the political power of African Americans, um, which minority do you believe has greater political power? African Americans today? Is, okay. <clears throat> um, Comparing gays and lesbians today with African Americans today. I'm asking which of those two minorities has greater political power, in your opinion? Um, are you asking in California or nationally? Because the answer might be somewhat different. Um, let me ask both questions. First, nationally. Which minority has greater political power nationally? Um, I think it's, it's somewhat difficult to make these comparisons um, because we, we, no, we, 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 haven't, we haven't sort of um, we haven't defined what we mean by political power, but uh, <clears throat> uh, well, that's if, what you were testifying well, about, sir. Okay, the, well, I haven't I haven't heard your question. I, I do have a view of it, which is what I said, which is the attention to attract or the ability to attract the attention of lawmakers. Yes. Um, uh, now, uh, using political power the way that you have defined it, yes. um, nationally, do you believe that the African-American minority or the gay and lesbian minority has the greater political power? And that's somewhat difficult to say. I would say that yes, no, or I don't know. I'd have to say I don't know to that. Okay. I would have to think about it more. Um, uh, now let me ask the question in California. Um, do you believe that in California the African-American minority or the gay and lesbian minority has the greater political power? I would say compared to the, the national level. I'm not talking about compared to the national level. I'm talking about in California, okay? In California today, you've got a gay and lesbian minority and you've got an African-American minority, right? That's correct. Now, what I'm asking you in California, because you brought it up. Yes, I did. Which of those two minorities has greater political power? Closer call. It's a closer call in California. That mean you don't know, but it, it, you're closer to knowing. Well, <laughs> I, I just don't know what you mean by closer call. Um, uh, I'm asking you about California. Yes. And again, the 
answer might be the African American community. The answer, I suppose, could be the gay and lesbian community. Or the answer could be, I just don't know. I think it's a complex analysis, and I can't really make a, a judgment on it one way or the other. Because you haven't made that analysis thus far. Is that fair? Well, I've made an analysis about the gay and lesbian um, community. I haven't done an extensive, as extensive an analysis of the African American community, either nationally or at the local level in California. And so it's difficult to make a comparison without having the same level of uh, analysis of the two. Um, I understand it, what you're saying is that you would need to do more of an analysis before you could answer my question as to whether the gay and lesbian community or the African-American community had more political power in California. Is that right? I would need to do more analysis of the African-American community, the ability of resources they have um, to bring to bear to the political process. I haven't done that. Is that right? I mean, I, I think I can say that they're not powerless. That's clearly true, that they've got political power in both California and the United States. The African American community. Yes, they do, as well as the gay and lesbian community. Yes. Um, I understand and I appreciate your testimony that the African American community has political power, both nationally and California. Uh, you've also said, in your opinion, the gay and lesbian community has political power in nationally and in California, correct? That's correct. And I just want to close this off. What I was asking you was to compare the political power of the African American minority with the gay and lesbian minority. And I believe you told me that you couldn't do that nationally. Is that correct? Correct. Right. And is it also the case that you cannot do that in California? I'd be hesitant to make a, a conclusion one way or the other on that. Yes. And. Um, is it fair to say that you think you have done enough work on the gay and lesbian community to answer this question if you've done a comparable amount of work on the African American community? I, I think probably so. Um, now, in terms of what you teach and the research that you've done. Yes. Um, I'm not talking about your testimony here, but I'm talking about your work academically. You have focused much more on the African American minority than on the gay and lesbian minority, correct? My academic work before this case, I think it's probably fair to say, although um, I haven't really dealt with ballot measures or analyzed ballot measures in as great a detail as I have with respect to gays and lesbians. Now, despite all of the um, allies that you say the gay and lesbian community has, um, they were unable to uh, pass Proposition 8. I mean, they were unable to defeat Proposition 8 or Proposition 22, correct? Yes, and I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one who mixes it I'm up. I'm sorry, what? I'm, I said yes, and I'm glad I'm not the only one who mixed that up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, thinking about all the power, I was almost <laughs> believing that it had failed uh, earlier. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, uh, now, you have actually written about why minorities who have a lot of political allies uh, nevertheless uh, suffer defeats in the initiative process, correct? I don't know if I phrased it quite in that way. Well, um, let's, let's, let's try to phrase it in your language. Uh, and in that connection, um, put aside the Williams book, just so we don't... You may. Thank you. Um,
have the volume, it's the third volume. The tabs begin at 78. Yes. <clears throat> uh, now, uh, I'd like to ask you to look uh, at tab 90, which is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2865. Okay. And can you identify what this is? Uh, this is an article I wrote for a, um, a journal called American Politics Research. Um, and when did you write it? Uh, it was shortly after the recall election of Governor Gray Davis. So the recall was 2003. It was shortly after that. Um, if you turn to the second page, um, actually, it's, it's on the first page as well, um, right under the title and your name, you see it says American Politics Research 2005. At the bottom, it says to March 2005. Oh, I see. I'm looking at the next page. 135. Or more precise, it, is, it was March 2005, correct? Okay. That's correct. Um, That's when it was published, yeah. It was probably written several months before that. Now, uh, let me ask you to look at page 138. And the second sentence of the first full paragraph, it's the paragraph that's right above the paragraph that begins by contrast. You see that? Uh, I see this, the first full paragraph of these three types. Is that where it begins? Yes, and then the, then the next sentence. The sentence that reads, sometimes called lawmaking without government, Broder 2000, the initiative process radically departs from the Madisonian system of delegation and checks and balances by substituting unfiltered direct democratic rule. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And um, uh, that's what you uh, wrote in uh, late 2004 or whenever it was you were writing this March 2005 article, correct? Well, again, I, I think it was shortly after the recall election, which was in 2003. And I can't remember. It would have been sometime in 2004 probably that I wrote this. And the answer to that question is yes, I wrote that at that time. Um, now, you mentioned that you uh, were a lawyer, um, and um, you have published at least one article in a law review, correct? Correct. And um, let me ask you to turn to tab 35, plaintiff's exhibit 1869. While he is doing that, Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 2865. No objection, Your Honor. 2865 is admitted, and this is tab 35 in our Miller book. Beg your pardon? Volume 1. Uh, this is Volume 2? <laughs> Did you say tab It is Volume 2. It is <clears throat> Volume 2. Tell me when be, would be a good time to take it. This would be a good time to take a break. All right. We'll do that. Uh, Ten minutes uh, if we can, counsel. So we'll be back if you can. At, uh, <laughs> so make it ten minutes of the hour. <laughs>